Hello there YouTube, and good morning. Devin here again with another helmet video for you, and this will be on America's really first steel helmet. Um, uh, I'm not really going to include the M1917, although it does have a part in this story to play, because the M1917 was basically an American copy of the British Brody helmet, the Mark I Brody helmet. Um, the only difference was is they just forego, uh, just left out one part of the liner, which was a rubber donut ring, and the rivets were slightly different. Um, the shell was slightly better steel, because Americans had slightly better access to steel. Uh, but other than that, it was the same, same exact helmet. Um, so the first helmet America really kind of designed themselves uh, was the M1917A1. But, uh, which is what the video will be on today, but first we got to talk about what America uh, used before the M1917 series of helmets, um, which was basically uh, this. Um, I don't have an American uh, campaign hat, but I do have a Canadian campaign hat. Um, the campaign hat was basically America's form of head protection, uh, unless you were cavalry, in which case you would get a Stetson, uh, which is... A lot of the same kind of features. It's a kind of hardened felt helmet designed to kind of protect your head from bumps as well as keeping the weather off of you. Uh, other than that it didn't really do much. Most armies going into World War I uh, were mostly using hats. Um, the exception being some cavalry units like the French uh, cuirassier who had steel helmets obviously but that was more meant for stopping sabers rather than bullets and the German Pickelhaube uh, which is more for uh, Again, uh, looking cool and stopping sabers rather than stopping bullets or shrapnel or anything like that. Um, so going into World War I, this was America's form of head protection. North America's unique form of head protection. Canada was the same way. Um, they issued campaign hats and uh, caps and stuff like that basically to protect your head. And basically what it did was protect you from sun and weather. Uh, that was about it. Um, the very first uh, helmets America would ever issue were, were literally bought from the British. They were Brody helmets. Um, and before the end of the war, they did kind of redesign and start, you know, when they were gearing up for their army. Uh, and by the end of uh, World War I, America would have made 2.7 uh, million M1917 helmets, itself being a copy of the Brody with some kind of American um, changes made. But overall, basically a, a Brody. So... Uh, then in 1934, we see this being introduced. Uh, this is America's first, like, entirely in-house designed helmet, um, and that being the M1917A1 Kelly helmet. Now, a lot of these would be converted. Um, earlier ones would be converted for M1917 helmets, because um, the M1917 helmet had problems, just like the Brody did. Um, the early M1917s and... Uh, the early Brody helmets were all one piece, basically. The liner was hard fixed to the shell, and uh, if the helmet was uh, damaged or the liner was damaged, which was quite flimsy, uh, it was made out of oil cloth and it had a net and uh, the leather chin strap went all the way around to the top of the helmet. It was all held in place by one kind of rivet um, and then just kind of secured from moving around too much by two little rivets on the, the little rim of the helmet here um, that the chin strap would run through. Uh, the uh, Americans really didn't like that. The British obviously really didn't like that either. It was very, very expensive to repair and replace and fix the helmets. Um, so the Americans came out in 1934 with this design, which is borrows the shell from the M1917, but makes the liner uh, removable um, by replacing the rivet at the top with a screw and a dome nut. As you can see there, it's a little brass dome nut with a brass screw poking through, and that's what holds the entire liner in, is one screw. Um, which is a very nice economic type of way to make a helmet. Uh, other than that, not much really changed. Uh, the chin strap would be uh, switched to canvas from leather. Of course, America being one of the number one producers of cotton in the world, it was much cheaper to use cotton webbing and stuff like that than it was uh, to use leather webbing. And uh, cotton held up a lot better in a lot of environments as well as being cheaper, especially in America. Because at this time, America was still kind of battling with that fact of being isolationist or interventionist. Um, so, you would see brass hardware on these helmets. Uh, the chin strap is brass hardware. Um, even the little end keeper on the cotton thing is brass hardware. 
1934, this design would be improved and helmets would start being converted, um, but you wouldn't see made from scratch 1917. So helmets that were designed to be 1917 A1s until 1941, which is actually like the last year these were made. So uh, you would see production start about 1937 of the conversion process, which was incredibly slow. You would see American soldiers using 1917 helmets uh, up until, you know, basically well into World War II when they would be replaced by M1s. Um, 1917 A1 helmets, uh, production was very, very slow. Um, they converted them at an incredibly slow rate to the American military at this time was still very tiny, uh, in the interwar period. Everything was, you know, they weren't the big military powerhouse they are thought of as nowadays. So, and then in 1941, they would start making 1917 A1 Kelly helmets from scratch. So instead of converting them, um, which was, turns out to be about the same price and actually, uh, a lot quicker to do than converting them, just stamping them out and making new ones from scratch rather than grinding out old liners, salvaging what you can and stuff like that off of them, uh, replacing chin strap bales that were worn out and rusty from years of use and stuff like that because they didn't have any other designs. So they were using them all pretty much continuously. There wasn't a lot of them sitting in storage. Um, so they had to do a lot of like repairing and retrofitting and repainting and taking rust off of them and uh, hammering dents out. And it turns out it was a lot easier to just make new shells and build them from the ground up rather than having to take them from uh, the soldiers in the armories and stuff that had them and ship them to somewhere and then convert them, you know, and repair them and repaint them and send them back out. It was much easier to just make them and send them out and replace them. So uh, in 1941, you would start to see purpose-built 1917 A1s that weren't uh, conversions anymore. Still the same high manganese content steel shell. Uh, so the American uh, M1917 uh, helmets and the M1917A1s are actually a much better steel than on the Brody helmets the British used. Uh, even into World War II, uh, the American 1917s had much better steel uh, in them. It's actually better steel than what's even in the M1 helmet, um, but the M1 helmet kind of counters that by being a design that displaces a lot more shock. Um, so it adds rigidity to the steel based on the shape of it, so you don't need as good a steel uh, as in the 1917A1s. But it's a very high manganese content steel, which is a kind of American thing to put a lot of manganese in their steel helmets. So, uh, and here's the liner. Um, if you've seen a Brody helmet liner, I don't have an original Brody helmet. Um, but this is an original uh, 1917A1 Kelly helmet liner. And what it is, is behind each of these uh, little tongues here, um, when we flip it around, it's an aluminum frame that this leather uh, is kind of wrapped around. You can see part of the aluminum frame there. Uh, spacing the uh, liner away from the shell of the helmet, which was really good at helping preventing shock from being transferred into the head, um, as well as this being much more comfortable than the oil cloth in a wide range of environments, a little bit easier to take care of and all that other good stuff. Um, and it was a noticeable upgrade in protection from the campaign hat or the Stetson. So uh, we will flip this uh, around now and uh, have you take a look at the liner and all that other good stuff and explain some of the differences between the M1917A1, the Kelly helmet, go over some more general history, and then we'll flip the camera back around and I will try this helmet on and we will see how it fits, how it holds up, how it looks uh, going prone and all that other good stuff and uh, what I think about it compared to some other contemporary designs of the day uh, as far as how it was compared. So stay tuned for that. Alrighty, so here we are. Uh, with the 1917A1 helmet, so the bottom of the helmet would be the front, uh, as you can tell here by the way the chin strap is kind of uh, leaning, um, but as you can see here the shell has its own bales for routing the chin strap, but the chin strap is actually connected directly to uh, this kind of aluminum frame you can see it there, uh, that this whole thing is connected to, um, and the whole frame is uh, obviously as you can see uh, under there held in place, but there's the brass dome nut, this is the original um, you might be able to kind of see it there in that screw hole, uh, full of horsehair. This crown pad is just a leather pad full of horsehair, um, which is, it worked back in the day. Um, you would see kind of later ones, uh, some of them with foam or other stuff put in it, but most of them you'll find will have horsehair in them uh, for the crown pad, uh, which worked. It was a nice soft kind of uh, 
material to keep that nut from hitting the uh, top of your head, which was a problem with the 1917 and uh, the early Brody helmets. Oh, I got a bit of the horsehair sticking out there through the top. You would load it in through this kind of little cut right here. Um, and uh, it would be held together with this knot that you would tie to the liner. Uh, but yeah, you can see uh, if I can grab this one little hair right here that's sticking out. It's a pretty long, wiry piece of horsehair, as you can see there. That's what the liner is, is full of. It's full of horsehair. Um, not the, the whole liner. This is just leather uh, with some padding behind it slightly, um, as you can see there. Uh, underneath the tongues there, there's more leather uh, to act as a pad. There really isn't any like foam padding, it's just a, another strip of leather. Um, and then on the outside of this is where uh, it's just aluminum under this piece of leather, but there's two pieces of leather right here, obviously with the liner, and then another one to provide padding. And then the crown pad full of horsehair, uh, which was used to keep the dome nut off of your head because uh, the dome nut was a problem that the 1917s and the Brody helmets had. Um, was whereas you would wear out the liner and it would kind of get beat down and stuff like that, that dome nut could poke into the top of your head and cause quite a, quite a lot of discomfort. So um, this horsehair pad actually goes a long ways to prevent that. Um, the liner is adjustable in circumference just a little bit. Um, so underneath right here, you could obviously see these two ties would be for adjusting the circumference of the leather liner, but the aluminum liner also could be kind of slightly contracted or expanded a little bit. So, um, but it's not a super convenient way to uh, do it or use it or anything like that. And the M1 that replaced the 1917A1 um, officially uh, on the front lines in 1942 um, which is when you start seeing the uh, M1 helmets actually make it to the lines uh, and the soldiers and stuff like that. But this was America's primary helmet up until kind of around uh, February or March of 1942. You would see uh, the M1917A1 quite commonly in the field. So, uh, especially in the early campaigns in the Pacific with the Marine Corps and stuff like that, the M1917A1 Kelly helmet was the kind of predominant helmet um, and after that, you would see mostly M1s. Um, these would stick around for training and stuff like that for quite a long time, basically through World War II until about 1945, when America had had so many people producing the M1s and stuff like that, that they fully replaced these. Um, these would stay in service on Navy vessels, though, for through the end of the war and uh, into the Korean War and stuff like that. You could see M1917A1s, especially with the Merchant Navy uh, and Civil Defense uh, groups and stuff like that, you could see these helmets surpass a lot long time. Uh, so, cause if obviously it's not worth throwing them away if they're still used, especially if you're giving them to somebody that you don't ever expect to actually see combat, there's no point in giving them an M1 or something like that. Um, so you can just give them these. So, and then you would see ones that would come out later that would have a different liner, like an, almost an M1, like Riddell style liner, um, attached to a bunch of fixed chin strap bales all the way around the shell like that um, into use in Vietnam with the Merchant Navy. Uh, the M1917A2, as it's known, that one's kind of rare. Um, as far as M1917A1s go, most of them are converted 1917s. They only made about uh, less than a million. It's around like 904,000 M1917A1s. Um, so it's actually, as far as American helmets go, one of the rarest American helmets out there. Uh, as far as numbers made, because like I said, they made 2.7 million M1917s. Um, they only made uh, 904,000 M1917A1s. So, um, now we'll flip the helmet back around here uh, and see how it looks being worn and all the other good stuff. I'll spin around and show it to you for multiple angles and all the other good jazz, and then we will wrap up the video. Alrighty, so here we have the M1917, and I will place it on top of my noodle here. Um, as you can see, it sits rather high on the head, as with most Brody helmet designs, they sit quite high on the head. Um, they don't really obstruct your vision or your hearing. They offer a really significant amount of protection from above, which is what this design was for. It was for the trenches and stuff like that. Um, and even before that, it was designed uh, as a helmet for protecting you from arrows raining down from above, uh, for the most part. So, uh, in the medieval ages and stuff like that or whenever that type of helmet was used, uh, which is where this design originally came from, but it worked well in the trenches as protecting you from shrapnel and dirt and debris and body parts and 
horse parts and barbed wire and fence posts and tires and other helmets and gun parts and other stuff that were churned up by artillery from falling down on you and hurting your head. It was very good at that. Um, this design is stemmed from that, obviously, a continuation of that uh, use well into the mid-World War II uh, era, like I said, um, where it would be replaced by the M1. But as you can see, it sits well above the ears. It actually, the helmet shell comes just above my ears, which is, and this helmet is adjusted to sit as low as I can possibly make it, actually. So it can sit much higher than this on your head. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a very nice, uh, comfortable helmet, actually, much more comfortable than the World War I ones. The leather uh, on this uh, liner is quite nice and comfortable. The crown pad helps quite a lot uh, as far as absorbing some of that weight and everything from it sitting on your head, especially with all the little leather straps that you use to knot the liner together to adjust it. Um, keeps a lot of the pressure points off the head, which makes this a relatively comfortable design. Um, so we'll talk about the profiles now. I'll spin around so you can see them all. So obviously this is it as uh, the front profile. Here we have the right side profile. Here we have the rear profile. And if I look up, even with my hood, uh, which is kind of used to simulate, you know, body armor, uh, life preservers, stuff like that. Um, basically barely touches, but gets nowhere near to biting into my neck or anything like that. Very, very comfortable uh, design. The chin strap works quite well. You can wear the chin strap uh, a bunch of different ways. Um, the left side profile, uh, obviously you see even into World War II and stuff like that, and in World War I uh, and interwar periods, you see a lot of troops wearing their chin strap up on top of their Helmet, a lot of that is because, not because uh, they didn't want the helmet to stay secure, but there was a huge myth for a long time that if an artillery round went underneath you, uh, which you're going to die from anyways, because it's an artillery round going off close, close enough to you that uh, uh, the shockwave would yank, uh, basically yank your head off your shoulders or snap your neck or something like that. So you see a lot of, basically through World War II and Korea, and by Vietnam that was kind of dispelled, but through World War II and Korea, uh, and especially World War One, you see a lot of chin straps up on the rim of the helmets and stuff like that, rather than actually being worn. Um, but you see a lot of training photos with soldiers actually with it being worn. You could wear it right uh, right across your chin here. Um, you could wear it right here along the slope of your neck in the crease there. You can wear it a bunch of different ways. It's really adjustable. Um, it's just a slider buckle for the most part, and then a little brass keeper, which is just used to keep it from having that little tail that slaps around. So it's a pretty simple design, really easy to use, really, really durable design. Uh, saved the U.S. a lot of money, obviously, by being able to convert their own helmets. And it's better than having nothing. Um, it's a lot better as far as protection goes than wearing this. So, uh, which is just goes to show how nice uh, people really, really liked them. And it's one of the more collectible American helmets you could possibly find. Um, out there and if you find one that's in good shape because this one actually happens to be a navy one it has the ship number on there 370 or this is the number from uh, where it would be put into the ship like it's armory number so when you take inventory and stuff like that but uh, it's a really really good condition one it's a little dusty um, but the paint is pretty much all intact except for a little scuff there uh, which is how I got it the liner is immaculate the chin straps immaculate it's basically unissued um, which is, I was super, super happy to get this one. Um, I've had it for years. I'm never really going to get rid of it, I don't think, unless time to get really, really, really tough. But uh, I really, really like this helmet. It's a nice design. I like the Brody design um, and the history behind it being kind of a World War One collector. And this is like the epitome of the Brody design for pretty, pretty much. It's hard to get a better Brody because of the steel quality and stuff uh, than the 1917A1. So, hopefully you enjoyed this video. You subscribe if you like the sort of thing. I really hope that uh, this helps a lot of you American aficionados out there. This being your first basically entirely in-house designed helmet um, because you changed up a lot of stuff from the British design because the M1917 was basically initially just British helmets, literally British helmets bought from Britain. And then you changed a couple little things basically to make it easier to produce for you. That was about it. So this is your first actual in-house design helmet uh, that was MASH issued uh, and used for the early parts of World War II, which is actually, this is one of my uh, kind of more favorite designs of World War II, and it's a lot lesser known and quite overshadowed by the helmet that replaced it, the M1. So hopefully you like this video, you subscribe if you like this sort of thing. If you want to support the channel in some way, shape, or form, um, 
I will leave a link to the Patreon down in the description. Being a Patreon member for as little as a buck a month gets you into the Discord, which is a bunch of really, really cool people in there. I learned so much from those guys all over the world. Um, and it's a really cool place where we talk about everything under the sun. Politics, food, smoking, alcohol, uh, history itself. Uh, we're really on a Napoleonic era uniform kick lately, if that's your thing. Uh, if you like to learn about all that cool stuff. And we talk about monarchies, uh, everything under the sun in there. Uh, it's a neat, neat, neat place to be. If that's one way you want to support the channel, that's the best way to do it. Um, and it really goes a long way uh, to support the channel as far as getting new camera equipment. All of that money goes into the channel. Um, but if you can't support the channel monetarily like that or anything, um, that's totally fine as well. Just watch the entire videos, like, comment, uh, interact. That really boosts me in the algorithms, which means YouTube will pay me more money. 2021 is already way down as far as the money YouTube is paying us. Um, it's basically been cut in half from 2020, um, which I hope it'll kind of pick up later in the year and stuff like that. But I don't want to drag on too much, but thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully I can see all of you in the next video and all of my special Patreon supporters in the Discord a lot later. Thank you all for stopping by, and hopefully I will see you all in the next video. Bye bye now.